Hi, this is Dave and Bruce once again as we continue our discussion in the Book of Mormon. This, today we're discussing 2 Nephi chapter 3. And Bruce, as we get into this, there's a scripture in verse 4 that I have a question about. It says, Lehi is telling Joseph, his youngest son, he says, um, Thou art the fruit of my loins. I am a descendant of Joseph, who is carried captive into Egypt. And great were the covenants of the Lord, which he made unto Joseph. It seems to me, Bruce, this is talking about something from the brass plates that Lehi is reading from. And it contains some great prophecies about who this Joseph was that was sold or carried captive into Egypt. What Lehi is doing is quoting from the book of Joseph or that is contained in the brass plates, uh, indicating that there was at least some record that was greater or expanded uh, in those brass plates than what we have in our, in our Bible, in our Old Testament. Now, there's many different books of Joseph's, if you want to call them, if you want to call these books that. Uh, there's the book of Joseph and As Asenath um, uh, that's contained in the Apocrypha and Pseudepigrapha of the Old Testament. There's also uh, the book of Joseph, uh, the Testament of Joseph in what's sometimes entitled the Testament of the Twelve Patriarchs, Joseph being one of those. But I think what's um, most important is that um, Joseph Smith actually translated uh, the book of Joseph as well as the book of Abraham. And so we will talk about that um, in the, in perhaps in this discussion. But I want to I want to get into the importance of Joseph, uh, the importance of Ephraim and Manasseh, Joseph's two sons. And so we want to look at that a little bit um, in connection with um, why Joseph is so important, why Ephraim and Manasseh are so important, and how they connect to the um, um, to the blessing and the covenant of Abraham. Well, to begin with, uh, we're looking to look back at uh, Abraham, the covenant of Abraham that he receives in the book of Abraham. This would be in chapter 2 of Abraham. The Lord tells Abraham there, he says, I will bless them through thy name, for as many as receive this gospel shall be called after thy name and shall be counted as thy seed. So those who accept the gospel, whether they're related to Abraham or not, are going to be able to, um, are going to be called the seed of Abraham. But then the Lord goes on in chapter, in verse 11 and then kind of explains something or adds more to than those who accept the gospel. And he says there in verse 11, And I will bless them that bless thee and curse them that curse thee. And in thee, that is in thy priesthood, and in thy seed, that is thy priesthood, which thy seed can be those who have accepted the gospel. For I give unto thee a promise that this right of the priesthood, the right to hold that priesthood, shall continue in thee and thy seed after thee. After thee. And then Joseph adds, that is to say, the literal seed or the seed of the body, shall all the families of the earth be blessed, even with the blessings of the gospel, which are the blessings of salvation, even life eternal. Now, it's interesting that in the Jewish traditions, they have two messiahs. They have Messiah ben Judah, and then they have Messiah ben Joseph. Now, Messiah ben Judah is Christ. Christ is a descendant uh, through, um, through the line of Judah. But there's a Messiah ben Joseph, and that Messiah ben Joseph is means the a messiah the son of joseph the son of joseph that was sold into egypt um, and so there's two two different messiahs in some of the more ancient traditions uh, of judaism and those two messiahs we see even showing up when john taylor says joseph smith the prophet and seer of the lord has done more save jesus only for the salvation of men in this world than any other man that ever lived in it. Now, is what John, what uh, uh, President Taylor is doing is, is basically saying that there's two that have done more for the salvation of men um, than anybody else. The first is Christ, and the second is the prophet Joseph Smith. 
So this is the these are the two messiahs. Messiah ben Judah is Christ, and Messiah ben Joseph is Joseph Smith, as Lehi prophesies there in chapter three of Second Nephi. Let's talk about the patriarch or the order of the patriarch and how that patriarch works. The patriarch is a prophet, priest, and king to his family. He's a prophet to give inspired guidance guidance. Uh, as any prophet would. He's a priest to provide the necessary ordinances of salvation and exaltation for his family. And he's a king to provide the temporal protection and the prosperity of that family. As it says in the Doctrine and Covenants, uh, in the celestial kingdom are three levels of degrees in order to obtain the highest. And man must enter into that order of the priesthood, meaning the new and everlasting covenant of marriage. That sealing or that marriage, a couple enters into that patriarchal priesthood. Now we see in the Old Testament, there are, there are patriarchs and there are grand patriarchs. Grand patriarchs must hold the Melchizedek priesthood authority in their responsibility for the spiritual and temporal welfare of those outside of their family lines. A single patriarch is responsible for the temporal and spiritual welfare of his own, of his own family line. Now a grand patriarch, and those grand patriarchs are listed, Adam, Seth, Enos, Cain, and Mahalil, as they're listed in the Old Testament. A grand patriarch is to assist his father in the temporal and spiritual welfare of all his father's children. So they're outside of his family line. In order to do that, they need to have a Melchizedek authority, which is Christ's priesthood, not the father's priesthood or authority, but it's Christ's authority. And Christ's authority is for the spiritual and temporal welfare of all his father's children and all his father's creation. And so that Melchizedek authority is given to these grand patriarchs because they need to f function for in behalf of a missing or unworthy patriarch within, within an individual family line. So the grand patriarchs um, must hold that Melchizedek authority in their responsibility for the spiritual and temporal welfare of those outside of their direct family lines. The patriarch being a prophet, priest, and king to his family. And the birthright son, who is that firstborn son, is not only responsible for his own family by virtue of the patriarchal priesthood that he holds, but is also responsible for the spiritual and temporal welfare of his father's posterity, which requires the authority of the firstborn or the authority of Christ. To be responsible for those outside of that immediate family line, a different authority is needed other than the patriarchal authority. And that's the Melchizedek authority or the authority of Christ. The firstborn and birthright son of the father has an inherent authority for the spiritual and temporal welfare of all his father's creation and all his father's children. The grand patriarch is the birthright son who should also be the firstborn son. However, the birthright goes to the first righteous born son who may not be the first born son. And we see this in multiple examples in, in, the Old, in the Old Testament, right? You can't change the first born son. The first born is always the first born, but the birthright son goes to the first righteous born son, as we, as we see in scripture. Adam is the first man, the father of the race, and the father of all mankind. He's the grand patriarch and therefore responsible for all the temporal and spiritual welfare of all his posterity. Adam, the first father and patriarch of humanity, is the first man. Adam is the firstling of humanity. He's the first one on earth, but not necessarily the firstborn or the birthright son of God, because that falls into the authority of Christ. So looking at this patriarchal lineage and how this lineage works, if you say, well, Adam had, we know about Cain and Abel. Uh, we know he had Seth. And then we don't know the names, but we'll just call him Bubba and Billy Bob. Uh, Abel, Abel is chosen to be the, the priesthood leader and the patriarch. So the younger is often chosen to be the priesthood leader and patriarch over the uh, anger sometimes of the older son. We see this with Michael and Lucifer in the pre-earth life, Cain and Ab Abel and Cain, Shem and Japheth, uh, Isaac and Ishmael, as we've mentioned, Jacob and Esau, Joseph and Reuben, Ephraim and Manasseh, Moses and Aaron, and even Nephi and, and Laman. So these grand patriarchs that we see in scripture are Adam, then we have Abel slash Seth, 
And I put Abel in there because the priesthood line is traced back through Abel in the Doctrine and Covenants. Then we have Enos and Canaan, Mahalil, Jared, Enoch, Methuselah, then Lamech, and then Noah, and then Shem, and then there's a number more, Ru, Eber, or Faxed, Ru, Eber, Peleg, right down to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. Uh, these, are, these are the grand, what we would call grand patriarchs, and they receive the Melchizedek authority because they have to assist their father in this temporal and spiritual welfare of all his children. So this patriarchal responsibility goes from Adam, Abel, Seth, Enos, Canaan, Mahalil, Jared, Enoch, Methuselah, Lamech, Noah, and Shem. And then we see it with Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, and Ephraim. That's that patriarchal line. These are the grand patriarchs who have to have not only the patriarchal priesthood for their own family, but have to have the Melchizedek authority. And then our age, the same line, this direct line, comes down to Joseph Smith Sr., He's a direct line of Adam through Abel, through Enos, through Canaan, through Mahalil, through Abraham, through Isaac, through Jacob, through Joseph, through Ephraim. And Brigham Young made the statement. He said that the, the blood of Joseph, speaking of Joseph Smith, which would include his father, Joseph Smith Sr., he said the blood of Joseph that was sold into Egypt runs pure in his veins. And so those grand patriarchs in our dispensation would come down through Joseph Smith Sr., Hiram Smith, Joseph F. Smith, John Smith, and then Eldridge G. Smith. And then he was released um, uh, or made emeritus uh, patriarch to the church. If you understand what's going on in the Old Testament, Reuben should have been the birthright. Uh, Reuben was the firstborn and should have been the birthright son. But Reuben lost that birthright can't change the firstborn, but he lost the birthright. And because the birthright goes to the one that opens the matrix, because it's the matriarch who chooses who the patriarch is, Reuben lost that birthright. And so it goes from the firstborn son of the first wife to the firstborn son of the second wife, as Rachel. Uh, that was the second wife. And her firstborn son, the one that opens the matrix, is Joseph. Even though he's number 11, he becomes the new patriarch. He, he becomes the birthright patriarch for the temporal and spiritual welfare of all his father's posterity. And so Joseph is that birthright son. So the responsibility of the patriarch that is to be responsible for the temporal and spiritual welfare of all of Jacob's posterity, all of the 12 tribes, is Joseph. And this is why it says and teaches in section 133 of the Doctrine and Covenants. We're reading that here, um, where it says, And they shall bring forth their rich treasures unto the children of Ephraim, my servants, and the boundaries of the everlasting hills shall tremble at their presence. And there, the, there shall they fall down and be crowned with glory, even in Zion, by the hands of the servants of the Lord, even the children of Ephraim, and they shall be filled with songs of everlasting joy. Behold, this is the blessing of the everlasting God upon all of the tribes of Israel, and the richer blessings upon the head of Ephraim and his fellows. So it's what this is saying is that Ephraim, through Joseph, and this is the prophecy that we're seeing in chapter 3 of Second Nephi, this is part of that prophecy, is that Ephraim is the grand patriarch. If you remember when Joseph is chosen of the 12 tribes, Joseph is chosen, then he has two sons, Ephraim, Manasseh and Ephraim, Manasseh being the elder. And when Jacob blesses them, he crosses his arms, putting his right hand on, on the um, head of Ephraim and his left uh, hand on the head of Manasseh. And Ephraim is chosen now to carry on the responsibility that Joseph has as the uh, patriarch of all of the tribes of Israel. This is why Ephraim and Manasseh have to be gathered out um, after the restoration, Ephraim and Manasseh have to be gathered first because their responsibility is for the, um, together, all of the other tribes of Israel, both temporally and spiritually. So question, Bruce, um, in there in verse two of uh, chapter three, Lehi refers to Joseph's being blessed upon the promised land, right? He says, uh, consecrate unto thee 
this land which is most precious for thine inheritance and the inheritance of thy seed uh, forever and his security forever. And we talked last time about the, prom the blessings of the promised land and the choice and precious land that Lehi was led to to begin with. So he's continuing on giving uh, Joseph this promised blessing to be on the land, not just to himself. Yeah, he's making a connection. I think Lehi is making that connection from the record of Joseph that he's that he's getting this much of his blessing from, from the brass plates there. But he's making a direct connection to the land because of what Lehi is. If you take this chapter and go through, Lehi will always say, and, and Joseph said, or our father Joseph said this, and he said that. And you can actually kind of break down and see what was in the in the record of Joseph uh, um, that Lehi is re either reading from or at least remembering in giving the blessing. And part of that uh, is a connection to that land of the everlasting hills, connection to that land uh, that Lehi inherits. Uh, because mm -hmm. Lehi, Lehi is prophesying in this, in this chapter. Um, he's explaining that Joseph saw them specifically. He saw Lehi and his posterity on that promised land. Um, and that's why he's talking about here in, in verse 2. Uh, and then we even see this with, in our Doctrine and Covenants in section 57. It says, uh, speaking about a promised land, oh, Hearken, O ye elders of my church, saith the Lord your God, who have assembled yourselves together according to my commandments in this land, which is the land of Missouri, which is the land I have appointed and consecrated for the gathering of my saints. Wherefore, this is the land of promise and the place for the city of Zion. So the Lord is explaining that Missouri is that, that area, is that land of promise. Now we can say, well, that really didn't have anything to do with Lehi, but I think it really does. Uh, because uh, of the many prophecies and promises in the in the Book of Mormon itself, um, we read in Ether ch uh, chapter thirteen, verses six through eight, and that a new Jerusalem should be built upon this land. And remember, this is a demonstrative that, that is near and very definite; it's under their feet. Um, that a new Jerusalem should be built upon this land, under the remnant of the seed of Joseph, for which things there has been a type. The Lord brought a remnant of the seed of Joseph out of the land of Jerusalem, that he might be merciful unto the seed of Joseph, that they should not perish. See, this is connected directly to what Lehi, the blessing that Lehi is giving to his son Joseph in chapter 3. Wherefore, the remnant of the house of Joseph shall be built upon this land, and it shall be a land of their inheritance, and they shall build up a holy city unto the Lord like unto Jerusalem of old. So is what it's saying is this land that Lehi goes to, will be a land for the inheritance of Joseph and his posterity, Joseph that was sold into Egypt and all his posterity. We see this also by a statement. Uh, one of the proclamations that were given uh, in the history of the church on the, on the um, hundred year anniversary after the, re after the organization of the church, President Heber J. Grant issues this proclamation. He says, it was not by chance that the Puritans left their native land and sailed away to the shores of New England and that others, others followed later. They were the advance guard of the army of the Lord predestined to establish the God-given system of government under which we live and to make of America, which is the land of Joseph. Now you, go, you can go right back to the uh, Book of Mormon um, and the statements in the, in, in the Doctrine and Covenants which is the land of Joseph, the gathering place of Ephraim, an asylum for the oppressed of all nations, and prepare the way for the restoration of the gospel of, of Christ and the reestablishment of his church on earth. Joseph had two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh. And we know that Lehi was a descendant of Manasseh, as he explains. Uh, Ephraim um, being part of those 10 tribes that were taken captive into the north countries in the northern areas. Uh, Manasseh ends up leaving uh, by Lehi. Lehi, uh, as a descendant of Manasseh, leaves and goes over to a new promised land as Ephraim goes into those north countries. Manasseh ends up uh, writing a record 
and then hides those plates. This is Manasseh, this is Lehi, this is Mer Moroni, as he, as, as Moroni, Mormon, and many of those earlier prophets uh, write on those gold plates. Manasseh hides up the record. And then Ephraim, when Ephraim comes, this is Joseph Smith, and Joseph Smith is Ephraim, a direct descendant of Ephraim, um, according to Brigham Young. Ephraim translates the plates that Manasseh leaves. Now we're talking about cousins here. Manasseh writes the record. Manasseh hides the plates. Um, Moroni, a descendant of Manasseh, a pure descendant of Lehi, um, explains to Joseph Smith where the records are. And Ephra, and, and Joseph, being a descendant of Ephraim, then translates those plates. Um, and then the first commandment he gets, we see in September of 1830, Joseph receives a command to take this new book, the record of Manasseh, he received the first commandment almost he gets after the organization of the church and the publication of the Book of Mormon is to make sure that this record comes back to Manasseh. And in DNC 28, we see the very one of the first missions that are mentioned in Scripture, and that was called a mission to the Lamanites. In verse 8, it says, And and not behold, I say unto you that you, Oliver Cowdery, um, shall go unto the Lamanites and preach my gospel unto them. And Parley P. Pratt ends up joining Oliver Cowdery, and this is what he writes about this mission. Thus ended our first Indian mission, in which we had preached the gospel in its fullness and distributed the record of their forefathers among three tribes, the Catarangus Indians near Buffalo, New York, the Wayne Dots of Ohio, and the Delawares west of Missouri. So we see that... Um, Parley P. Pratt, Oliver Cowdery are taking this gospel, the very almost the first command. Joseph gets the record from Manasseh. Joseph and Ephraimite translates the record. And the first commandment they get is to take that record back to Manasseh, that translation. Joseph writes, and we see this in the history of the church, volume four. Joseph writes about the Lamanites in that area around Nauvoo. He says, I accordingly went down and met Keokuk, Kishkukash, Apinos, and about 100 chiefs and braves of those tribes, the Saxon, the Fox, uh, Native Americans, with their families. Joseph continues, I conducted them to the meeting grounds in the grove and instructed them in many things. Now listen to what he says here. I instructed them in many things which the Lord had revealed unto me concerning their fathers. That was one aspect, the things that the Lord revealed concerning their fathers and the promises that were made concerning them in the Book of Mormon. So he's talking about two different things, one revelation and the other the things that are in the Book of Mormon, as he's speaking to these Native Americans in, the same, in that same area where Oliver Cowdery and Pratt came years before. Joseph also, this is just before his martyrdom, just about a month before his martyrdom, he says, at 1 p.m., this is in his diaries, I held counsel with the Indians, the sack and the fox in my back kitchen. I replied, the great spirit wants you to be, be united and live in peace. I found a book presenting the Book of Mormon, which told me about your fathers, and the great spirit told me you must send, send it to all the tribes you can and tell them to live in peace. So, so Manasseh hides the record, Ephraim translates the record, and Ephraim's responsibility is to get that record back to Manasseh. And Bruce, that that seems to be very definitive about where the promised land is. Oh, I, I think it is. I think you, you cannot read through, the, especially the Book of Mormon. If you look at the prophecies and promises within the text itself, within the Book of Mormon itself, it's, it's very clear where that... Uh, where the setting is for the Nephite nation, the Nephite and Lamanite nations are. It's very clear when you look at the prophecies and promises. If you look at the ge geographical passages, you can go, you can be anywhere. You can be all over the world. There's between 150 and 180 different maps using the geographical passages, which tells you that there's something wrong with the system. Right. You know, if, if you're coming up with that many with that many different maps using the exact same passages of scripture, the geographical passages, then that tells you something wrong with the system. But if you look at the prophecies and promises 
um, that were made to Lehi and that uh, Mormon talks about, uh, that Moroni talks about as he concludes the record. If you look at the prophecies and promises, you can't make any mistake. The history is bearing witness to the, the prophecies, the fulfillment of those prophecies and promises. Very good. Well, talking about the book of Joseph, now I'm, I'm just going to um, sidetrack here and talk about the book of Joseph that Joseph Smith translated. Well, a number of, a number of years ago, the, I was asked um, um, to do some research on the book of Abraham. Um, um, the finding of the papyrus in Egypt, uh, right down to what happened to the papyrus, what happened to, uh, to the mummies, um, um, the translation, the manuscripts, uh, what was in the manuscripts. And so I was given the assignment to, uh, to do research on this. And so Michael Chandler comes to Kirtland, uh, who has, and Michael Chandler has four different mummies and a chest of drawers full of papyrus. Um, he comes into Kirtland on July 3rd of 1835 and is brought to Joseph Smith. And Joseph Smith asked if he could look at the papyrus for a few days. On the 6th of July, Joseph Smith comes back and says that these papyrus would lead to the translation of the book of Abraham and the book of Joseph that was sold into Egypt. Now, uh, Chandler was trying to sell the mummies and the papyrus, and Joseph Smith uh, put up $800, and two other men each put up $800, and they purchased the, the mummies and the papyrus were purchased um, for $2,400. Uh, Joseph immediately begins uh, working on the translation, again, by the gift and power of God. He didn't have the ability, the intellectual ability to do it, but he begins working on the translation uh, of the book of Abraham and finishes that manuscript. And then he translated the book of Joseph. Now we have two thirds. We have most of the book of Abraham. Joseph, um, while he was in Nauvoo, was preparing the manuscript for publication. And the manuscript that he translated is different than what was published because he perfected it. He, Joseph was wanted to make sure it was prepared uh, correctly for publication, just as he said that the Lord would hold him accountable for anything he said. And so he was preparing it for publication, and he was publishing um, the prepared book of Abraham in installments in the times and seasons. And he got through the first two installments before his martyrdom. Uh, so we are lacking uh, the last third of the book of Abraham, and we're lacking the book of Joseph um, that was sold into Egypt. Even though he had finished the manuscript translation, he had finished that manuscript's translation, we were lacking, he, he never got to finish the prepared um, manuscript for publication. Uh, however, in 1967, there were papyrus found in the Metropolitan Museum, the Joseph Smith papyrus. They call them the Joseph Smith papyri that was found in the Metropolitan Museum. And among that, uh, those papyrus that were discovered there by Azia Atia, um, uh, a copt from uh, Egypt who was doing research on uh, and cataloging um, Egyptian collections in different museums in the United States. Um, he discovered that uh, the Metropolitan Museum had the Joseph, had some Joseph Smith papyri there, and they knew that because the plot map of Nauvoo was on the back of one and on some paper that would, uh, it had been glued to, as well as a bill of sale from uh, Emma and, and Lucy, uh, Lucy Max Smith and Emma Smith both. And so they knew it was the Joseph Smith papyri. But in that, there was one facsimile, large facsimile, that Joseph Smith... Uh, said and was uh, from the book of from the book of Joseph and so we have that facsimile as well as there's a few more that uh, showed up uh, within that uh, collection of papyri this drawing behind is one of that one of the larger facsimiles that was in the book of Joseph and I will go through that this is what is written in the messenger and advocate in October of 35 about um, this particular facsimile you see in the background. And um, 
published in the Messenger and Advocate, it reads, the inner end of the same roll, Joseph's record, presents a rep uh, representation of the judgment. At one view, you behold the Savior seated on his throne, crowned and holding the scepters of righteousness and power, before whom also are assembled the twelve tribes of Israel, the nations, languages, and tongues of the earth, the kingdoms of the, over the kingdoms of the world over which Satan is represented as reigning. Michael, the archangel, holding the key of the bottomless pit, and at the same time, the devil is being changed and shut up in the bottomless pit. But upon this last scene, I am able only to give you a shadow of the real picture. So, is, this is describing one of the facsimiles in the book of Joseph. Now, when I was doing the research, I realized that the papyrus that the church had did have this facsimile to the book of Joseph. And so I began doing some research on, you might call it a facsimile, but this judgment scene that we that is so common in the book of the dead. So this is Joseph's explanation to, to Oliver Cowdery, who writes the explanation down of a facsimile that's in the book of Joseph. So we kind of have an idea of what these things are talked about. Now, a lot of people don't realize that the manuscript was finished. The book of Joseph manuscript was finished. And, you know, we're never going to have it because Joseph never really really prepared it for publication. Um, and he is he's the only one that could do that. And so it's not going to be something that we're going to have to be able to uh, peruse or look through or have. There's all the other books of Joseph out there. You have in the in the Apocrypha and Pseudepigrapha of the Old Testament, you have the, the story of Joseph and Asnath, uh, the wife, uh, Joseph and his wife. Uh, you also have in the test what's called the Testament of the Twelve Patriarchs. You have um, a testimony and a test or a testament of each one of the patriarchs, and Joseph is in there also. Um, so there's at least two records that we have of Joseph out there. We know there's one in the brass plates because Lehi is quoting it. We know that uh, there was another one that Joseph Smith began uh, that Joseph Smith translated that we don't have, uh, but we do have some glimpses of what he felt was important within the. This is actually the explanation of um, that facsimile, just like we have explanations of uh, um, the three facsimiles in the Book of Abraham. This is an explanation of the facsimiles in the Book of Joseph, and this is what the papyrus actually looked like because I'm going to compare it with some of the others that are found out there that have been discovered, and so we want to have it the same way. There are certain elements that are there. This is a representation of the judgment. Now, you see these numbers here, 1, 2, 3, and 4. These are some of the, uh, are connected to the explanation that Joseph gives to Oliver Cowdery. One, the Savior seated on his throne, crowned and holding the scepters of righteousness and power before whom also are assembled, now we're going into two, the twelve tribes of Israel, the nations, language, and tongues of the earth, the kingdoms of the world over which Satan is represented as reigning. Uh, Michael, the archangel, holding the key of the bottomless pit. Uh, that's number three. You can't see it very well, but there's a, there's a man standing here. It would be Thoth, and he's writing what the, what the judgment is, is, is revealing here. And then number four, the devil being chained up and shut in the bottomless pit, which represents the great devourer here. We're seeing certain elements here that are in all judgment scenes. This is another one that's very similar. You have the dead person on the left. You have the scales. You have Thoth here writing it down. You have the presentation of the dead person here by Horus. You have the, um, the 12 who set in judgment up here, sometimes 12, sometimes 14. Uh, who are setting in judgments, and then you have the God on the other side setting on the primordial, on his throne, on the primordial mound, the four sons of Horus, or the four pillars of heaven, the four corners of the earth, and then the, you have the legitimization by uh, by the mother and wife on the on the back side. Uh, these are some others, and we'll talk about this. Uh, the one below, uh, the one on the top, is from the Book of Joseph uh, and the Joseph Smith papyri. The one on the bottom is from the papyrus of Annie. Now, Annie was a scribe, and so his um, his vignette or his facsimile, whatever you want to call it, his judgment scene is more complete than most of them because he, most people had to pay to get these things done. Annie uh, was a scribe, and so he it didn't cost him anything to do it. And so we have the elements, the same elements. You have the dead person over here on the left, 
uh, down below, just like you have the dead person right here. This one, um, you see your uh, arm is to the square and raised up. The other one's coming underneath that. You have Annie here. Uh, you can see the scale barely on the upper one from the Joseph Smith papyri. There's a scale there uh, with the two arms coming out and the, and the sides coming down, uh, which is very much like the scale you have right here in the bottom in the papyrus of Annie. Um, then you have Thoth, uh, which is writing down the judgments and, and, and the weighing of the heart is what it's called. Um, Thoth is right here in the upper part. You can't see it because of the tear very well, because of the separation of the papyrus. But you can see his feet here. You can see part of his head and one of his arms going up, just like Annie's is here riding on the, uh, with the stylus. Uh, then you have this great devourer up here. Um, he's called the great devourer, and here he is down below in the papyrus of Annie. Now, he's uh, part crocodile, part lion, part hyena, and part hippopotamus. He's everything you don't want to meet in Egypt after dark. And he's waiting for the judgment because this is what's taking place. And we'll talk about this, what's taking place. He's waiting to eat the heart. And then you have the presentation of by Horus uh, with Annie to the God on the other side of the veil. So all of these same elements are there. So you have the dead person here. You have the 12 who sat in judgment. To the, uh, you might call them the 12 tribes, the 12 apostles, uh, all nations of the earth. Uh, so the elements are the same there. Uh, you have the scale represented in both of these there. You have um, the great devourer and Thoth, uh, who's the, often called uh, the scribe of the gods. In the Enoch literature, um, um, Enoch is called the scribe of Jehovah. Uh, then you have Osiris uh, sitting on the throne here with the four sons of Horus there. The center one here is the presentation and and. Annie being admitted into the presence of God, but you can see the same elements that are there. And so this is broken, this is breaks it down a little bit more so it's easier to see. So you have the dead person, uh, his heart is being weighed against the Ma'at feather. Ma'at feather is the character of God, right here on the scale. It's the character of God and his heart, or the character of Annie, um, has to equal the character of God. It, it, one cannot be heavier than the other or lighter than the other, according to the Egyptian traditions and mythologies. Uh, Joseph Smith said it this way. He said that, the, um, that we have to have the character of God in order to dwell with God, and that's what this is representing. Um, so anyway, you have the 12 who sat in judgment, Annie the deceased. This represents the spirit of Annie. It uh, has the wings of a bird, but the same face of Annie, setting on his tomb. Um, here's his heart, his character being weighed against the character of God, the Ma'at feather here. Um, uh, we have Thoth who records it. Uh, the great devourer waits uh, for, the, for the judgment, hoping to uh, have some heart for dinner. Of course, that never happens because you pay good money for these things. Uh, Annie is then brought to this particular point by the escort. There's always an escort going through the heavens, just as we see in in first nephi or uh, with uh, uh, the stories of abraham the, there's always an escort taking one from this life into the next life um, into the presence of god and so annie is brought to this point he's passed everything and horus has his arm up uh, in the presentation um, and in that presentation this is the important things that said um there's three brethren talked about the book of um about the book of Joseph, the manuscript of the book of Joseph. There was Elder McConkie, uh, James E. Talmage, and Sidney B. Sperry. And each one of them said that the things contained in the book of Joseph were of such a sacred nature that it shouldn't be published. Um, Elder McConkie went on to say that he felt that some of the things that were in the book of Joseph led to the restoration of the endowment uh, at Nauvoo. Now, and that could be the case. That very well could be the case. Um, but the interesting thing here is what's being talked about in this yellow section here. Um, and if I can read it, I've, I've studied Egyptian, so I know I can pretty well translate it. And it says, 
saith, Thus saith Horus, the son of Isis, I have brought unto, unto thee, O great God, the Osiris, the Osiris Annie, and here's Annie's name. And then it says, His heart has come forth from the balance. Um, uh, and then it says, he has not sinned, it, it, his heart, his character, has not sinned against any god or any goddess, and Thoth hath weighed it according to the counsel of the decree, or the decree of the counsel of those that were setting up above. And then it says, um, it's been right, it's been, it's been true and right. And then it says, may he be given, may he be given, um, uh, Efta um, Henket, uh, bread and beer. And then it says, Peret M. And then it says, May he enter into the presence of Osiris and become like the followers of Horus for eternity. So, is what he's saying, is what the guide is saying, what the um, escort is saying about Annie. He says, I'm coming before you with the Osiris Annie, the redeemed Annie. And his character is such, his heart is not sinned against any god or any goddess. And then it says, may he enter into thy presence and become like the followers of God for eternity. Sounds like, Bruce, that uh, he's uh, very similar to what we receive, Adam having been true and faithful. Uh, <laughs> it is. It's basically the same. You have to remember that first Pharaoh was a righteous man, it says in Abraham. The first Pharaoh was a righteous man and sought earnestly to imitate that order established in the days of the first patriarchal reign, even the reign of Adam. So um, that first Pharaoh set the <clears throat> government of Egypt up based on the patriarchal order, and he set the religion of Egypt based upon the patriarchal religion, and that's what's being here. Now, the same thing, this an abridged version of this presentation scene was in the book of Joseph, and that's what... Um, we read in the Messenger and Advocate as Joseph explains what that papyrus is. And that's maybe why Elder McConkie, um, if, if he, Sperry, and Talmadge saw the manuscript, why they all said that it contains things of such a sacred nature, and maybe why Elder McConkie said that he felt like the restoration of the endowment at Nauvoo came because of some of the things that were in, in the book of Joseph. So we see these connections there. This is... Uh, Wallace Budge's translation. Here is the text that we, I just read from on the side. And it says, uh, and here's Budge's translation. Now the red is kind of a little correction that I put in there. Thus saith Horus, the son of Isis, I've come unto thee, O great God, and have brought the resurrected Annie. His heart is pure and has come forth from the balance. He's not sinned against any god or goddess. Thoth hath waited according to the decree uttered by the council of the gods. It, Annie's heart or character, is true and very righteous. Grant that he may be given cakes and beer, or bread and beer, and may he enter into the presence of Osiris and be like the followers of Horus forever, which is to be exalted. So that's what the translation is saying. So we have this upper one is a facsimile from the book of Joseph connected to that judgment uh, that we see in almost every, every book of the dead. You don't get that in gospel doctrine class, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah. and if, you, um, <laughs> if you say anything about it, you'll get thrown out of gospel doctrine. You probably so, will. Yeah, uh, let's go back here to um, uh, to verse 15 here. And this is the prophecy from Joseph uh, that was sold into Egypt. And he shall be like unto me for the thing which the Lord shall bring forth by his hand, by the power of the Lord, shall bring my people unto salvation. Joseph, uh, who was sold into Egypt, he goes into Egypt um, and saves all of the children of Israel. Oh, that's right. He saves all of the children of Israel, temporally speaking. He saves them from the famine that's taken place in the land of Canaan. And so Joseph is saying that this seer that's going to be raised up, who's going to be called by his name, Joseph, is going to be like unto me, but this time he's going to bring salvation to, unto my people, i.e. all of the children of Israel, all those who accept the gospel. Uh, so he's going to be like Joseph because they're both going to save the children of Israel um, and all, all mankind, which is in fulfillment of that prophecy that we 
started out with not a prophecy, but the blessing to Abraham that through his little literal seed shall all of the families of the earth be blessed with the blessings of salvation and life eternal. Go on to chapter four. Here Lehi is now pretty much on his deathbed and he starts speaking to his his uh, in, his his son's children as well, Laman and Lemuel's children and daughters as well. Um, and he said that in verse one there of chapter four, it says uh, about these prophecies of Joseph who was carried away into Egypt. And he truly prophesied concerning his seed, verse two, and the prophecies which he wrote, there are not many greater. <laughs> and he prophesied concerning us and our future generations. And they are written upon the plates of brass, which you've been talking about. Yeah, the um, I think it's interesting that he says that there are not many prophecies in the brass plates that are greater than the prophecies of Joseph. That you know, there's more there's more in the book of Genesis about Joseph than any other person in Genesis. You might think it ought to be Abraham, but there's more about Joseph and his life in the book of Genesis. Okay, than any other one person, and so uh, Joseph plays an in. Uh, a very interesting and integral part of the history of the world from his blessing in Genesis to his blessing in Deuteronomy uh, to his saving Israel uh, because of the famine, the children of Israel to right down to uh, Joseph Smith Sr., the grand patriarch, a direct descendant of Abel and a direct descendant of Joseph um, who was sold into Egypt uh, and the seer that's going to be raised up like unto Joseph of old, which is Joseph Smith, coming back, making it full circle back to those two great messiahs in Jewish tradition, Messiah ben Judah and Messiah ben Joseph, one being Christ and the other being Joseph Smith. And so I think an interesting thing is we, um, we see that uh, Lehi talks to the children. He doesn't talk much to Laman and Lemuel, uh, but he talks more to the sons and daughters as we see in verse um, um, uh, verse 3 in, in this in this chapter he says my uh, after my father made an end of speaking concerning the prophecies of Joseph he called the children of Laman his sons and his daughters and said unto them behold my sons and daughters who are the sons and daughters of my firstborn I would you, I would that you give ear to my words inasmuch as you shall keep the commandments you'll prosper and inasmuch as you will not keep the commandments, you'll be cut off from my presence. Huh. Um, That's that same thing that started in First Nephi chapter two. It is. It's it's the it's the great uh, promised blessing of of the Book of Mormon. But he says, "My sons and daughters, I cannot go down to my grave. I uh, save I should leave a blessing upon you, for I know that if ye are brought up in the way you should go, you will not depart of it. Depart from it." Wherefore, if you are cursed, behold, I leave my blessing upon you, that the cursing may be taken from you and be answered upon the heads of your parents. Uh, now, okay. that we don't often talk about if we look in, what is it, section 68 of the Doctrine and Covenants. Because just as, just as Lehi is saying that if the children go wrong, then there might be something, <laughs> something that might have something to do with the parents. Um, I've often said that you, you don't get the sons of Helaman, you don't get the 2,000 stripling warriors uh, without the parents of the sons of Helaman, without a father that's willing to die for his beliefs and a mother that's willing to share their testimony and teach them in the right ways of the Lord, just as Abraham or just as Lehi had said uh, back there in, in, um, in, in chapter 4. Uh, but in section 68 of the Doctrine and Covenants, it says, and again, inasmuch as parents have children in Zion or any of her stakes which are organized, that teach them not to understand the doctrine of repentance, faith in Christ, the Son of the living God, and of baptism and the gift of the Holy Ghost. By the laying on of hands when eight years old, the sin is going to be upon the heads of the parents. Now, there's a couple of things here we don't often talk about. Um, that teach them not to understand. Now that makes the assumption that we 
as parents understand it. Um, it's also not only expecting us as parents to understand it and to teach it to our children, but it doesn't say in as much as parents have children in Zion or any of her stakes that are organized and have their teachers, the young men's and young women's leaders teach them not to understand. It's the parents' responsibility, the, the bishop, his counselors, the uh, young men's and young women's leaders and, and their teachers are to assist the parents in their teaching, not take the place of the parents in their teaching. Even in this section, it goes on and talks about <clears throat> those in Zion. He says, Now I, the Lord, am not well pleased with the inhabitants of Zion, for there are idlers among them, and their children are growing up in wickedness. Now here's the wickedness. They also seek not the riches of eternity, but their eyes are full of greediness. They're not contemplating the eternities. They're not realizing that there's another world out there. They're not realizing that, that um, they can't take this life seriously until they take the next life seriously. And so we see these very same things taking place in section 68 that are corresponding to those passages in in uh, Second Nephi chapter 4, where Lehi is saying, look, if your parents aren't teaching you the way they're supposed to, that's going to answer upon the heads of the parents, not necessarily upon the children. So there again, it reinforcing the, the uh, adage of teach the rising generation true and correct principles, and then they will govern themselves. Uh, yes, and that's what we're supposed to be doing. That passage in the Old Testament says, if you train up a child in the way they shall go, they shall not depart from it. That's exactly what Lehi was saying. Uh, he, he tells the children in verse 5, he says, um, um, I know that if you're brought up in the ways you should go, you will not depart from it, which is very much like that passage of the Old Testament. And of course, he had the brass plates, so he's probably echoing those <laughs> same words. Probably is. In as much, if you train up a child in the way they shall go, they shall not depart on, uh, depart from it. That doesn't necessarily mean this life. You know, that can mean the next life, because the spirit world's part of this probationary state, and that's where they will understand perfectly the plan of salvation. So in this chapter, Lehi does pass away. There in verse 12, we learn about that. And his brother's... Now, unleash their fury upon Nephi. Yeah, it seems like that Lehi was the was the glue that kept the family together. Right. And of course, Laman and Lemuel, they've they've got some issues right from the very beginning. They're they're worried about their inheritance. You know, Laman's the uh, eldest. He should have got a double inheritance. Right. But he wasn't the birthright son. But he does not he doesn't end up being the birthright son. Nephi then becomes somewhat despondent or at least reflective on the state of his relationship with his brothers. He starts out by saying in the, what might be called the Song of, of Nephi, O wretched man that I am, in verse 17, my heart sorroweth because of my flesh, and my soul grieveth because of mine iniquities, and I am encompassed about because of the temptations and sin which so easily beset me. So he's talking about the flesh, and that's what uh, Lehi talked about in chapter 2. Um, 229, right? Yeah, in chapter 2, verse 29, he talks about the um, the flesh and the evil contained therein. Yeah, he spent time on that last time. Yeah, and he talks about the flesh, and he talks about temptation. If you look down at the end of this, um, in verse 27, which actually puts bookends onto what, Lehi, what Nephi is talking about, Verse 27, he brings both of those same things up. Uh, why should I yield to sin because of my flesh? And why should I give way to my temptations? So that sets up for a chiastic pattern if you look at those bookends. Um, and then he changes. Awake my soul, no longer droop in sin, rejoice. Uh, he's pulling himself out of that depression. And, every, and everybody does have a depression uh, to a certain point when they begin to realize who they are compared to who God is. Uh, you begin to look for forgiveness and look for strength in, in God. And that's what Nephi's doing here. Um, in verse 31 too, he, O Lord, wilt thou redeem my soul? Wilt thou deliver me out of the hands of mine enemies? 
these three questions. Wilt thou make me that I may shake at the appearance of sin? That's his character traits, don't you think? Yeah, and the enemies are the temptations in his flesh. Not his brothers? <laughs> well, that's that's there, but but if you look at what he's actually saying, he's talking about he's talking about the the flesh and the evil contained therein, and he's talking about temptations. Okay. And then he says in thirty one, redeem my soul, deliver me out of the hands of mine enemies, which can, as Paul talks about, the same thing in the New Testament. Wilt thou make me that I may shake at the appearance of sin that. You can, that he cannot look upon sin, save it be with abhorrence. So maybe it's maybe it's that it's not the brothers he's so much worried about as it is himself. And that's always the greatest the problem. The greatest problems we have is not because of somebody else. The gospel doesn't. The gospel makes sure that we don't have to be a victim to somebody else. And a person who wants to be a victim can never progress spiritually. And that's what Lee. And that's what Nephi is saying i want is what i want to do is i want i want to shake at the appearance of sin i i i want to be able to to i i don't want to look upon sin save it be with abhorrence i want to have no more disposition to do evil which are explanations of those who are sanctified as we read back in alma chapter 13 and he has faith enough to even ask the question verse 33 wilt thou encircle me around in the robe of thy righteousness isn't that, that part of that embrace that you've talked about before, Bruce? It is. Encircle me in the robe of thy righteousness is, is another. Encircle me uh, to embrace. I like the robe is another word, is the same word as atonement. So concluding here in chapter 5, uh, again, there's a, here we see a, a pattern. Lehi and his family leaves Babylon or the, before Babylon comes and conquers Jerusalem. And now here, 30, 40 years later, Lehi or Nephi is having to separate himself from his enemies, from his brethren who want to take his life. The, the Lord, we, we learned elsewhere, the Lord always leads away the righteous. And that's what we see happening here in verse five. And it came to pass, the Lord did warn me that I, Nephi, should depart from them and flee into the wilderness and all, all those who would go with me. Same thing happened to the Lehi leaving. The same thing happened to the Rechabites we see in Jeremiah. Uh, the same thing happened to Abraham. Uh, as he says there in, in that uh, first chapter of his book, I saw that it was needful for me to obtain another place of residence. Almost the same thing that Nephi is doing. But the Lord leads away the righteous. He protects the righteous by leading them away into the wilderness. And so Nephi takes his family. Uh, takes Zoram and their families. Takes his, his takes his um, brothers Sam and and Jacob, and they flee into the wilderness. Uh, they live in tents, uh, and anything that they could take with them, as we see here, they did journey in the wilderness for the space of many days. Uh, took their tents and whatsoever things were possible that they could uh, travel with, and they did pitch their tents. Um, they call the land the land of Nephi. Uh, they called themselves the people of Nephi, and we did observe to keep the judgments and the statutes and commandments of the Lord in all things according to the law of Moses. That's telling us they, they still kept the law of Moses. Um, we see in section 84 of the Doctrine and Covenants that, um, that they lost that higher priesthood. They lost that higher order, it says, until John, that's John the Baptist, and the Nephites, the Lehites, were of the children of Israel, and they lost that higher order, uh, the same as the other children of Israel did. Um, and Nephi is telling us they, they kept all of the statutes uh, and commandments, all according to the law of Moses. And because of that, they did prosper exceedingly. They did reap again in abundance. They uh, did raise flocks and herds and animals of every kind. Then Nephi starts talking about the records. He said, we had bought, brought the records which were engraven upon the plates of brass and also the ball or the compass which was prepared for my father by the hand of the Lord according to that which is written. And they began to prosper and to multiply. And Nephi says, I took the sword of Laban and did make many swords, lest by any means the people who are now called Lamanites should come upon us and try and destroy us. 
for I knew their hatred towards me and my children and those who were called my people. And then he says, I did teach my people to build buildings, to work in all manner of wood. Notice he says all manner of wood. He doesn't list the types of wood, but then he's then the metals, he says, and of iron and copper and brass and steel and gold and silver and precious ores, which were in great abundance. And then he says they built a temple and they did construct it after the manner of the temple of Solomon. It couldn't be made out of such nice things, but it was constructed after the manner of Solomon. And they know they they knew what it was because on the brass plates they had all of the measurements and the design of the temple of Solomon. But it wasn't, you have to keep in mind, it's an Aaronic temple. It's not a Melchizedek temple. It's an Aaronic temple. And the temple of Solomon was an Aaronic temple and functioned as an Aaronic temple because they didn't have that uh, that higher law. I mean, they they had the knowledge, but they could not, they were still living, the, it even tells us there that they were still living that law of Moses. Um, and the manner of construction was like under the temple of Solomon because they had the record. They had that on the brass plates. They knew how to do it. They knew how long to make it, the size they needed to make it. And Nephi says, he did cause my people to be industrious and labor with their hands. And so it says that these, that the Lamanites will be used as we see in the Old Testament, that, that Persia and that Babylon and that the nations surrounding Israel become a scourge to thy seed, a scourge to Israel to stir them up in remembrance of me. And inasmuch as they will not remember me and hearken unto my words, they shall scourge them even unto destruction. So if, if, we're, if we don't take the reminder when God reminds us, then, then the destruction is made sure. It, the destruction is made sure, as it says later on in the, in the, uh, in the Book of Mormon. Then 27, once they get settled, settled in, living, building houses, says we lived after the manner of happiness. And 30 years had passed away from the time we left Jerusalem in verse 28. And then he starts talking about records. I kept the records upon my plates, which I had made for my people. And then the Lord said unto me, make other plates. Now there's, there's, there's other plates that's talked about. Um, and there's these plates that's talked about. And then there's those plates that are going to be talked about later on. So there's three sets of plates, these plates, those plates, and other plates. These plates are the small plates of Nephi, the small plates, everything that we have um, from first Nephi to the words of Mormon, those are these plates. Uh, those, plate, uh, those plates will be the plates of, of Mormon and other plates will be the record of the history. And that's what he says unto me. Make other plates uh, in verse 30 that thou shalt engrave in many things upon them which are good in thy sight for the profit of my people. Uh, but it's the history, the history of the people. So well, thanks, Bruce, and thank you for staying with us. We learned a lot today, um, some of which uh, might have been new to many of you, but and to realize that Joseph Smith was indeed a prophet. And it's such a great thing to possess these records now in our day.